Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a court hearing over concerns with the MCSO's compliance with the racial profiling ruling. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us for his monthly discussion of city issues and we'll visit a Mesa restaurant where a pipe organ steals the show. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. Sheriff Arpaio and one of his chief deputies were in court today to explain some comments that were critical of the court and its oversight of the Sheriff's Department. Here with the latest is J.J. Hensley of the Arizona Republic. Good to see you again. This is, uh, what was all, what was this court appearance all about? Was it really a couple of words said at a training session? It was. Um there was a training session back in October before they did a crime suppression operation in the Southwest Valley. Uh, the stated reason for this operation was because one of the sheriff's detention officers had been killed in uh, his driveway when he was getting ready for work and they wanted to attack gang activity in the area. Uh, the, the operation took place after the court injunction and before the monitor was appointed, so I think that raised some concerns initially. And then uh, Arpaio's chief, chef, chief deputy, Jerry Sheridan, made statements during the training that were caught on tape and, and really became kind of uh, a key point in the hearing today. Indeed, they, they said the judge's order was, uh, quote, ludicrous and, quote, crap. And I guess the judge wanted to find out what exactly he meant by that. Absurd, I think, was another yeah, word there you he go. used in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 I think a crap was in there. Anyway, if it wasn't, it probably was in some <laughs> way. Intended, yeah. right. um, so what kind of the hearing today? Was Sheridan was he contrite? Were they, was everyone on their best behavior? It seems like Sheridan came in ready to kind of fall on the sword and, and beg for the court's mercy, or at least ask his forgiveness. Um, and in a lot of this entire thing about how kind of the sheriff's office moves forward under this court order is, is whether they're going to have to ask for forgiveness from the monitor or ask for permission after the yeah. fact. Uh, they want it to be where they he reviews things after the fact. The plaintiffs, of course, wanted the monitor to be there for oversight. I initially, the judge went with the sheriff's office. Uh, this has kind of raised that issue again, too. How much should the monitor be able to there to, to say during training and before major operations instead of simply reviewing the material they produce after the fact. What, uh, let's say the sheriff's office wasn't quite as contrite today or may not be quite as contrite the next time something like this happens. What can the judge do? Well, I mean, you know, in, in the paperwork that was filed before the hearing today, he said that he felt they had violated the injunction. So that's a violation of a federal court order. Mm -hmm. You go down that road far enough and you have people being held in contempt and brought into hearings to explain why they shouldn't be held accountable for violating a court order. So that's pretty far down the road. I think from talking with the reporter who was there today and some other folks on this, it seems like this was more a way for the judge to establish early on, um, I'm paying attention, I know exactly what you're saying, and um, if it doesn't meet with the confines of my court order, then we might have to talk about it or you will be brought in here to talk about it. So it kind of served, uh, put them on notice. So these words, whatever they were, these, these words were uh, during this training session before an operation in October. What do we know of that operation and did the Sheriff's Department handle itself any differently during that operation? I think that's going to be the question for all of these going forward and, and it really comes down to what reasons did they use? Why did they choose a certain area for this operation? Because we know in the past that, that the judge found that they, they targeted areas with a high Hispanic or Latino population uh, in order to do their crime suppression operations. So why did they choose this area? And then when they're making stops during the operation, what were the reason for those stops? Mm -hmm. uh, they have to document it before and after the stop. Sheridan and some of his training remarks uh, made light of the documentation before the stop. How could a deputy poss possibly know who he's stopping? Um, the judge took note of that in his uh, written order. And so I, I think that's, that's one of the things that we'll have to look at going forward. And, and the thing with this operation that, that's particularly kind of curious is I, I got to look at some of the arrest logs after the fact. And um, 
the percentage of Latinos and Hispanics who they stopped and who they arrested is really not that different from, from those operations that got them in trouble with the court in the first place. So it really is going to come down to why did they stop this person, how long did they, they detain them, and what reason could they articulate for that stop or that detention. Interesting. Um, so this case is still being appealed, is it not? It is. It's in the Ninth Circuit right now. The Sheriff's Office is, is pretty dismissive that anything will come of that, but they've made note of the appeal several times. And, yes. and I, the judge is careful to, to kind of consider here, Judge Snow, that, you know, um, there's still First Amendment rights. They can still call my order absurd Lud yes. or ludicrous <laughs> or crap or whatever word they want. But when they're doing training, and if training is the crux of, of the problem here, then that training has to be accurate and meaningful. And, and the way that Sheridan characterized the judge's order in that our October training, Snow said, was neither of those. Interesting. Okay. Um, Department of Justice case. What's, what's happening there? It's still going strong. It is still going. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a surprise to some people, even uh, some of the plaintiffs in, the, in this case, which was started in 2007. Um, because they feel like a lot of the issues that, that are being discussed here have been resolved. But we know from talking with uh, restaurant owners who had their business, their work sites raided, um, uh, one ASU student who claimed he was a subject of an unlawful arrest and detention. The DOJ folks are still out there interviewing people who have nothing to do with patrols or crime suppression operations and do have everything to do with the way the sheriff's office handles itself in, in other uh, realms of the office's operations. Is this, this uh, not the most urgent of investigations, it seems? I mean, this has been going on for quite a while. It has, and I, I think there's probably some since in the sheriff's office that if they can wait it out and yeah. maybe it's a change in administration, then, then things can change. And, and I think uh, even uh, we've seen that before in, in other areas. I know a guy who used to work for the sheriff's office here um, was counsel in Ohio where they had that issue come up uh, between Clinton and Bush. And when Bush got, a, got elected, he appointed a new uh, yeah. attorney general and all was said and done. And there it goes. Yep, went away. All right. Well, uh, JJ, the story never seems to end. Uh, thank you for updating us on the latest. Thank Good you. to see you. Yeah. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton visits the Arizona Horizon set each month for an update on issues facing the state's largest city. And joining me now is the Mayor of Phoenix, Greg Stanton. Good to see you. Busy man these days, huh? I love being busy. I wouldn't have it any other way. It's <laughs> fun. Thanks for having me on today. State of the city address. A lot of things were addressed in the address. Um, one of your quotes I thought was interesting. Our challenges aren't cyclical. They've been building over the decades. What are these challenges facing Phoenix? Sure, well, I appreciate you uh, talking about the State of the City speech. I think we're at a very exciting time in our city, but only if we make the right choices and look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves. And I think it's critically important to, for all of us to understand that we can no longer have an economy that is overly reliant on real estate uh, and construction. In the new economy, the modern economy, an international economy, we have to change the way we do, uh, we do business. So some of our uh, challenges that we have, we have to realize that if we're going to advance this city, and that's exactly what I want to do as mayor, we're going to have to look at things a little differently, build a more innovative uh, economy, really focus on international trade, building an export uh, economy, making sure we have the right built environment, including improved uh, public transportation and light rail. So a lot of ideas about how we advance the city, but the, the idea is, uh, the way we did things in the past are going to have to change moving forward. Can you force that change? I mean, how do you end a dependence on construction? 
we have to build the right kind of economy. That's the number one thing. Look, the reality is that in too many ways, we would grow so fast, particularly on the outskirts of the town, and then hope we could create jobs so that people could pay for the mortgage that they just took out to move into the house. We need to flip it on its head. We need to build a strong, uh, higher wage economy with a higher educated workforce so that real estate and construction is laggard. It's based upon having such a strong economy as opposed to the other, other way around. We need to get more people graduating high school and moving on to college and having careers here in Phoenix. We need to advance in the industries of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. These can't just be words that we speak. They have to be actions that we take. And that's exactly what I have done and will do as mayor is advance on these actions. I was going to say, what actions can you, how can a city improve a lagging college graduation rate? What can a city do? Number one, we need to make sure that all of our young people are reading by third grade. There's, no, there's not a better indicator of future success than early childhood education, whether kids are reading at grade level by uh, third grade. So we have a whole initiative. Phoenix is partnering with the Arizona Diamondbacks for a program called Read on Phoenix, where we're deploying uh, many volunteers in our schools and in our libraries so that kids that need extra reading help, those kids that may have fallen behind, get the extra help that we need. We're employing AARP, our older citizens, experienced citizens, uh, to say, hey, we need you. We need you now more than ever that that experience that you have, bring it to the classroom, bring it to the after school programs to help with this issue of uh, reading by third grade. And we're going to work with all of our school districts, including especially Phoenix Union High School District, to make sure that particularly our fast growing Latino youth population has the skills and support they need to graduate college ready and then move on to college and have the skills that they, that they need so that they can graduate uh, within a four or five year period. So there's a lot of things that the city uh, can do and we're going to do it. You also talk about creating idea based, an ideas based economy. What does that mean and how do you, how again, can a city push entrepreneurs, push big ideas? Well, first off, you need to have, you need to send a message that we are an entrepreneurial friendly community. One way of doing that, do all you can to support incubators, co-working spaces. These are, this is the kind of work environment that the entrepreneurs who are building the jobs of the future want to work in. So we, we're partnering with Cahoots in uh, downtown Phoenix, uh, Seed Spot, uh, Maricopa Community Colleges has a great incubator called CEI. We're looking for as many ways as possible to create those core working spaces. We also need the innovative infrastructure. It's the reason why our success in bringing Google Fiber to this community and executing on Google Fiber, bringing super high speed internet, 100 times faster than the current speeds, is incredibly important to send a message that if you're a home-based business, you're working in an incubator, incubator location, you're gonna have the innovation infrastructure so that your business can succeed. How do you get that message out when the state might be sending different kinds of messages in a variety of ways? How, how do you, I, I'm keep going back sure. to this, but how can a city do all this when it's surrounded by the state? Well, first off, uh, cities need to lead. Uh, and that's exactly what I plan and have done uh, as mayor. Whether it's sending a message that every single person in your community is fully supported. We did that when we passed a fully comprehensive non-discrimination ordinance providing additional support for our disabled citizens and our LGBT uh, citizens in, in our community. I thought the state unfortunately was starting to head in the wrong direction. Thank goodness the governor vetoed SB 1062. But I think it showed that in many ways a difference in values. At the city of Phoenix we understand that supporting every single person in our city is necessary to advance our economy and it's what business leaders, it's what large corporations, it's what entrepreneurs expect and they spoke with one voice when the business community, both locally and nationally, asked our governor uh, for a veto. That's just one example of many where City of Phoenix, as the largest city and as a forward-thinking city, needs to lead the state. Trade with Mexico is, an, is another example. I think in many ways the state of Arizona was heading in the wrong direction relative to our policies supporting our diversity within our, within our communities and in many ways turning our back with Mexico, Phoenix has made it clear we're going to we're going to advance that relationship. We're going to open up a trade office, and by the way, now the state of Arizona is going to be our full partner on it. So the the state has come along and been, be, become our partner, and I I couldn't be more excited. You want to double exports to Mexico in five years and double all exports in ten, but the, the five years to Mexico, um, why does Phoenix lag 
other border cities in this area. What the heck's, what, what's been going on? Well, Mexico is already our number one trading partner. Exports are going up to Mexico. Imports from Mexico are going up as well. So the relationship is heading in the wrong direction. But the truth is that we are behind. We're behind Texas, we're behind California, yeah, some come? of our uh, competitive communities. I would say it hasn't been as much of a priority as it should be. Now with me as mayor, certainly it's gonna be at the very top of the list when it comes to advancing our economy, creating jobs in our, uh, in our local economy. We need to improve the infrastructure at the border uh, itself. And to be perfectly honest, we need to stop passing laws that send a message that we're a divisive uh, community. That doesn't help advance that relationship because never forget that Tourism and shopping, folks from Mexico visiting our community is a critically important part of our economy. And when you pass laws that send the, the wrong message, those individuals will choose, they'll vote with their feet, if you will, to go to other locations. So I think, I think right now the city is leading, the state is being much smarter about their relationship with, uh, uh, with Mexico. I was down in Mexico City just last week in the last few days with Speaker of the House Andy Tobin. He and I are full partners uh, on this effort. So I really believe that we're headed to a very good direction at, and that Phoenix and the state, though we are behind now, will catch up very quickly. Can you catch up and get a good message when you've got a budget shortfall of what, 37 some odd million dollars? How did that deficit happen? Well, first off, look, uh, budget challenges should never divert you from your longer term goals. The number one thing we can do to change things like having deficit in the city of Phoenix is to build a stronger economy, a longer term, uh, a more durable uh, economy. And that's exactly what the leadership that I'm trying to provide at the, at the city is to build that, uh, to build that uh, economy. Look, uh, we, are, we are in a short term deficit situation. The city manager has proposed a budget that is reflective uh, of that. We are now entering an important phase of this budget process where we're going to be taking that on the road. I am proud of how the city of Phoenix goes through a very open and transparent budget uh, process. I would put our process against any process of state in the country uh, as well as any city across, uh, across the country. So we're going to take the, the budget proposal that the city manager has put forward. I, as mayor, am going to do what I need to do, which is to listen to people's ideas, listen to their concerns. And then obviously in May is when we're going to actually vote upon uh, a, a vote upon that uh, on that budget. The reality is, is that revenue didn't uh, the revenue projections didn't equal what the reality uh, is. And that's a challenging thing. Myself and the vice mayor, Bill Gates, former vice mayor, Bill Gates, wrote a memo to our city manager asking that we look into the way that we do budgeting to make sure that we improve was, upon that. So that I was going to ask, what, yeah, with the projections didn't, didn't quite pan out by a long shot here. What happened there? Um, well, we're getting to the bottom of that, to be uh, perfectly frank, and we've asked that our new city manager, Ed Zerker, is a great guy. He was unanimously supported by the city council. He is an honest individual. He's an ethical individual. I believe he has the trust of the community, the trust of city employees, the trust of our labor groups. He certainly has my trust. Uh, and I have tasked him with coming up with a better process in which we will uh, that do these budgeting forecasts, and I'm confident that he will come up with an improved process. Employee pay cuts, city positions eliminated, swimming pools, senior centers closed, maybe code enforcement affected. Those things are all likely, aren't they? Well, I got to like that's got to be honest about something. Uh, anything to do with employee compensation or benefits is right now being negotiated by our city manager with our employee labor groups. And until they reach agreement, and I believe they will reach agreement, uh, I don't want to prejudge any changes uh, in that regard. So it's important to note that the proposed budget does not include any changes to employee compensation because it would be inappropriate for the city manager to include any uh, changes to employee compensation until they've been agreed to. We, we have a meet and confer process. We have a long-term trust relationship with our labor groups and uh, we've got to continue on that path. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. Okay, but the other factor, I mean, city positions eliminated is likely. Swimming pools and such likely to be closed and you might see some code enforcement stuff. Critics are saying, you know, projection is one thing, but the city has simply been overspending. Is that a valid argument? Well, I know often it comes up the issue of uh, pension and other types of mm -hmm. uh, uh, long-term compensation. Look, this is exactly why when I became mayor, we took some immediate and strong steps to reform the pension system. We put pension reform on the ballot. It was overwhelmingly supported by the people of, this, of the city, over 80%. Um, the increase in terms of savings from that will 
increase over time. Uh, we passed significant pension spiking uh, reform. You combine those two, it's going to save over $800 million. I'm not naive. We have some, some tough decisions that we need to make in the short run. I won't prejudge what those decisions are going to be because we haven't gone through the public process. And my job, number one job as mayor, is to listen to the people of, uh, of the city of Phoenix. But as you know, this city had almost $300 million in a budget deficit just a, a few years ago. And working with the community, working with our employees, we were able to get through those tough times. Challenges that we're having right now, these short-term challenges, we're going to do exactly the same process, work with the community, work in partnership with our uh, labor groups, and we are going to come up with a budget that minimizes the impact on public safety, minimizes the impact on our core city services. That's been my values and ethics in my entire time in public life, and it's going to continue to be so. And very quickly, look at ways in which those deficits got there and make them, not, make them go, don't, don't do that again. Well, look, we have to look both short-term and long-term, and that's exactly what we're tasking our city management uh, to do. As mayor and council, we don't have a budget office. This is not like <laughs> Congress. This is not even like the state legislature mm -hmm. that has its own budget office. Uh, our form of government is such where the budget office really lies with the uh, city manager. That's why you have to have a trust relationship with your uh, city management. But ultimately, the buck stops with me. I will ultimately, the mayor and council will be the ones that will vote on this particular budget. And uh, I know people want to kind of get to the end of the story at the beginning, but the truth is, We've got to go through this incredibly important public process before I make my final decision on this budget. All right, Mayor, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. As always, my pleasure. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. It's not often you find a pizza place that emphasizes entertainment over pepperoni. But producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana take us to a Mesa restaurant where the food isn't necessarily the focus. While pizza is part of the name at Oregon Stop, I look at things as we're more of an attraction than a restaurant. And this <laughs> is the main course. This is probably the most unique musical instrument ever built. Originally built in 1927 to accompany silent movies at the Denver Theater, the mighty Wurlitzer organ made its way to Arizona more than 50 years later to be restored and improved. This actually is a combination of many organs uh, that have been installed throughout the country as well as some of the pipes have come over all the way from England. Charlie Baylog came from the East Coast to work at Organ Stop. It's one of the few places in the country affectionately known as Pizza and Pipes. I very often get, uh, you know, the deer in the headlights look, you know, because I look at them and I say, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I, I play a pipe organ in a pizza parlor. You know, they get that look. This is the look they get when Charlie plays. The console where he sits produces no sound on its own. It features a bunch of keys, buttons, and switches, more than 1,000 in all, and they control nearly 6,000 pipes, 17 percussion instruments, and two pianos. The blower room is where all the air is generated for the organ. There are four different blowers in there. When they're working, they turn out uh, compressed air at about 15,000 cubic feet a minute. And that then is channeled into the organ and to what we call the regulators, which control the amount of air pressure going to different sets of pipes. So I often tell people looking at the blower room is like looking at the boiler room of the Titanic. because <laughs> It's incredible machinery. Between slices, sips, and songs, the audience gets a music lesson. Gonna take you on a real quick tour around the room. Here on the left-hand side is a special set of pipes that sound like tuned birds. Cowbell. Even a set of horses' ears. But there's something pretty amazing the audience can't see from the dining room. A dozen towering pipes the largest stretching 36 feet high. And it only produces one note at 16 cycles a second and a 7.5 on the Richter scale. So if you're sitting home watching TV or you're having dinner or whatever and you feel the ground shaking underneath you, it's just me. <laughs>
It's funny, you know, there will be people who come in here one night and I'll be talking to them. They're like, gosh, I've lived in Arizona for 40 years. We had no idea this place was around. But, you know, then sometimes you could be in places like Taiwan. You know, people that are visiting, you know, are overseas visiting something and they actually live in Arizona and they'll be talking about to people about where they live. And the people there will say, oh, do you live in Mesa? Have you been to Oregon? Stop. Once they have, guests can say they've seen and heard what's believed to be the biggest Wurlitzer organ in the world. In 1927, a Wurlitzer organ cost about $35,000. Organ Stop owners estimate today's replacement value at more than $4 million. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, an update on Arizonans registering for insurance under the Affordable Health Care Act, and a look at new research on using RNA as a biomarker for brain injuries. That's Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.